This is the Woke Daisy. Hello, TW Dears, and welcome back to a brand new episode of The Woke They See. I'm Nahal. And I'm Annika. And you know, these last 10 months with quarantine have been a little crazy. Remember when we thought it was going to last three weeks? Yeah, no. (laughs) I was living with my parents for a good four to five months, which was obviously amazing. I got a lot of quality time with them. But house prices fell in San Francisco, and that was my sign. I had to move to the big city. And I did completely the reverse. I thought I'd make it in New York, we'd be fine. And within the first week, my parents told me I wouldn't be able to handle it and that I need to come home for a couple of months because quarantine would be in place. I didn't listen. The next week they came and got me anyway. Six months later, I finally left and moved in with my husband. So to say the least, I lost six months in New York and it has been a wild ride through quarantine as I'm sure many of you can relate to. So something a lot of people that have been struggling with during this whole stay at home thing is boundaries. And I definitely struggled with boundaries with my family and work because you're working all the time since you're working from home, but then you're also not working at all. So it was a super hard time for me to find this balance, but a lot of people in relationships, especially found boundaries to be super difficult with their partner. So it got me thinking like COVID isn't ending anytime soon. And this is still such an important topic to cover. So let's discuss all things boundaries during quarantine. And we actually read this amazing blog post by the one and only Anjali Chakra and reached out to her to see if she'd be willing to discuss more in depth about her relationship with Sufi, what that quarantine period has been like for them, and some mental health and boundary tips that we can all learn. For our listeners, we're sorry this is much later than anticipated, but we've been trying to plan this for months with Anjali. Anjali, thank you for being here. And for those of our listeners who don't know you, tell us a little bit about yourself. Hello, thank you so much for having me and congratulations on your wedding, Annika. Thank Um, you. I'm an event planner specifically for weddings and the occasional art or music event. And I'm based in Oakland, California. I also happen to be a content creator with my partner, Sufi, because we went viral for being an LGBTQ interfaith couple last year. And we've been making YouTube videos and shooting content ever since. Um, I'm a Capricorn. And we're known for being very organized, which is helpful for balancing my job and my online work. And I would say my friends know me as the girl they can go to for good advice or a home cooked meal. And then when I'm with my family, I'm the most talk- talkative and excited and energetic sibling. And then when I'm not working, I'm begging my partner, Sufi, to make me her bon me, or I'm falling flat on my face in my new roller skates like many people in quarantine. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Uh, Yeah, we're so excited to have you on. And one of my favorite things about what you actually just said also was you became this overnight Instagram sensation with your girlfriend, Sufi. And a lot of people are saying that you have been representing the South Asian community and the LGBTQIA plus community in a super positive way. And so I follow both of you closely on Instagram and on your YouTube channel. But how has it been rising with your quote unquote fame with your significant other? It's been quite an interesting experience, to say the least. Um, I feel like being in the public eye for something that's as personal as your relationship and your sexuality can be a bit harrowing at times, especially when you receive as much hate as we do for just existing. But I definitely think that supporting each other through that has been a huge growing experience for both of us. Um, And one thing that Nehal, you and I spoke about earlier is the word representation itself and why Sufi and I actually don't like to use that word to refer to ourselves. Um, I think that there are definitely people out there who see their own experiences reflected in us and that's amazing and that's why we can continue to be so public about our lives. But referring to us as South Asian LGBTQIA plus representation can be harmful because at the end of the day, We are cisgender, we are caste privileged people, we live in the US, so we don't have the lived experience of many other South Asian queer people. So I just think that referring to ourselves as representation might contribute to the erasure of those groups. So that's why we don't use that term um, in general, but we don't mind if other people feel that way about us and we really love hearing from people who feel that way about us. 
You said something really powerful just now about how there's sort of a reflection in your experiences. So even though you aren't necessarily representative of hundreds of thousands of different people, you are a reflection of something, a facet of them that they see, you know, in you when they look at you and you're on this platform. So of course they, you know, feel like, oh my gosh, there's a piece of me somewhere, you know, out in the world and it's being accepted and it's being praised and that's kind of awesome. So for sure, I definitely think that that's a really powerful point to make about representation as a whole. And you mentioned too that you and Sufi have been doing content creation and that you guys are doing so many different things together, as well as the fact that you're quarantined and locked down together. Um, so well, how has it been living together during quarantine and also working together? Um, I think we were lucky that we got to make those two transitions at separate times because <laughs> going from being a romantic relationship to working together was definitely a huge adjustment for us. Um, I think when you become acquainted with somebody for a relationship, it's a very different way that you would approach the relationship than for like a business partnership. So there were definitely some things that we need to we needed to work on or iron out um, as we started working together. But living together in quarantine, we actually don't formally live together. Sufi has her own apartment. Um, but for quarantine purposes, it just made the most sense if we weren't going back and forth and exposing our roommates to one another. Um, so we decided to live together. And it's been really, honestly, a lot of work. Um, we had to- <laughs> I like that you're honest. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm like, we're so upfront about it because I feel like a lot of times when people are public about their relationships online, there's this tendency to not want to show the parts that are a little bit harder. Um, and this is hard. This is hard for everyone. I wish that it was like automatically like rainbows and butterflies for us um, spending all of our time together. But we definitely had to work on our boundaries and like work on these new kinds of relationships that we have to one another. Something that you had and I had actually talked about was just about how you and Sufi are both very artsy and stuff. So when it comes to these projects, there's obviously a creative direction that you have to take. So can you maybe tell us how you work through agreeing or disagreeing on a creative direction and like the best way you give either criticism or disagreement with the other person? I know that can be really difficult because you don't want to hurt their feelings, but also at the same time, when you don't, I think an idea is not going to work. It's just not going to work. Yeah, I think we had to practice letting each other take the lead on things um, because sometimes, you know, at the beginning I was working in a corporate job. I wasn't really in a creative field and I ne hadn't necessarily kind of like stepped into my comfort zone doing creative work yet. So um, I felt more comfortable letting Sufi take the lead on most of our creative projects until later on when this kind of became more my thing, it started being more of my work to be creative. I had to say, hey, I wanna take the lead on this. I wanna like let you in on my vision. Um, it's cool because when we work side by side, a lot of times we'll have opportunities to do two different things creatively. Like we might be working on a campaign or a shoot together and we both have completely different concepts, but they're for the same thing. Um, so we're lucky in that regard, but I think we just had to be really soft with each other and express when our feelings were hurt about things. We just had to sit down and say, hey, it made me feel really sad because it made me feel like I wasn't allowed to be as creative as you on this project or on this piece of our project. And I wish that I had more freedom to express my idea to you. And then we just roll with that going forward. And that's one thing that I really love about Sufi is that no matter what it is she always just wants to make things better and i learned a lot about her in that regard too i think you're talking a lot about like having open communication and i'm actually really curious to know how communication develops over time within within your relationship i mean a lot of times i see people who maybe take an hour on a friday and they said okay let's have like a mini therapy session and talk things through is there something that you and sufi have done during quarantine and being together that has helped you kind of be more open and communicate properly? I think communicating better and more softly with each other has always been something that we are, we consider like a work in progress in our relationship. Um, we do do little mini check-ins. We don't have like a specific day or time, but we just kind of sit down and talk about 
okay, what are the things that I'm already doing that make you feel loved and appreciated? What are the things that I can do better that could make you feel more loved and appreciated? Um, and I think in those conversations, a lot of things around how we communicate what we're feeling, how quickly we jump to conclusions about what's going on in the other person's head, those things naturally come up. Um, but also taking the time out of our day to separate from one another for a little bit and really spend time alone um, with our, whether that's with our thoughts to process through an interaction or an argument that we had, or if it's just to get some breathing room from each other, that's been huge for us because we've been together so much. We're together in so many parts of our lives. So just me taking a walk with my roommate or Sufi going and having a FaceTime call with a friend from New York, we, um, we just, it's really important for us to get away from each other, collect ourselves, and then we can come back to each other with something new. We have something new to talk about, something to bring to one another that we reflected on or something that we talked about with a friend that reminded us of the other person and made us feel like, oh, we can do better in our relationship. Just those little like check-ins and those moments away really help us. What are some of the tips you've mentioned, you know, taking time apart, also taking time together and just trying to find not only the balance that works for you, but the communication styles that work for you, the moments of discomfort that you might need to talk yourselves through to try and figure out how to navigate issues that are getting in the way of total happiness. What are some of the tips that you guys can give um, to people about setting boundaries with their significant others, especially because... Things aren't open right now. An escape route is sadly un unavailable at the moment if you're really, really ticked off and you just need a little bit of time. And, you know, we've been limiting our interactions with the kinds of people and the number of people that we've been hanging out with. And so how do you set boundaries in a situation that really doesn't have too many at the moment? Um, I think the most important thing for us has been remembering that boundaries exist for a reason. So this is one thing that we keep coming back to in our conversations about boundaries is that. I need my time apart from you so that I can reflect, be better and bring my best self to you. So, and we both say that to each other all the time. So that's the most helpful reminder when it comes to setting boundaries with my significant other um, and also her with me, vice versa. Um, so whenever there's something that we want to set a boundary around that might hurt the other person's feeling or feelings or that might be hard to understand, right? Because a lot of us grew up in South Asian households where the concept of boundaries didn't really exist. Um, but just creating that space where it's okay to set that gentle reminder and be like, you know what, I need this. If I go and I spend an hour in my room right now, just listening to music and cleaning, I'm going to feel more organized in my head. I'm going to feel really clear headed and calm. And then I can make you your favorite food and not feel stressed out about the way my room looks, you know, like, small things where we're just reminding each other like the why behind setting boundaries makes it so much easier to just respect it and sometimes you need that affirmation of like it's not because i don't like you that i don't want to spend time with you i just really need this to be my best self and to be the best partner that i can be to you i think sometimes people take the word word boundaries and it can be very harsh. So I remember using it with my parents when I was living at home during at the beginning of COVID, actually. And they did not like that word. They're like, no boundaries, doesn't exist. But then if I phrased it in a way that they could understand. So there were just certain topics at the dinner table that I didn't like um, to talk about because I thought that they were trigger words or they would start a fight with the family. And so when I had said, like, let's send some boundaries at the dinner table, they were like, no, no, no. What do you mean boundaries? We're a family. You know, we don't need boundaries. But then when I said, okay, how about we don't talk about these certain things so we can be happier and like have a really good dinner and do that and that worked better. So have you had any instances like that where the word boundaries has been received in a negative way? And do you have any advice for people who are listening to this of maybe how to approach their parents or significant other in a better way? Oh, totally. And um, I'm still trying to figure out because I think my parents are generally, I'm lucky, are generally pretty good about respecting boundaries. So I haven't necessarily had to explain it to them. But in friendships and even in my relationships, I've had people feel like, oh, why do we have to have boundaries? Exactly like what you were saying. Like, this is an open space. This is like, it's you and me. We don't need boundaries between us. But I think thinking about like, it's not a boundary in between two people, but it's like a boundary around your relationship to protect it. 
that kind of language has really helped me explain things to people, right? Like this, this amount of me time needs to be here so that I can protect our relationship and it can be the best it can possibly be. Annika, now that you're living with your husband, have you felt anything similar to these boundaries already? It's been like three days. As he sits on the couch right there and watches <laughs> me record this podcast, I am not completely sure if I feel totally comfortable saying that. No, um, no I'm just kidding. I, uh, Yeah, you know, so what happened was actually with us is that we were planning on moving in together, uh, you know, in the six months, seven months prior to all of this craziness. And because COVID hit, we didn't end up moving in together until technically two weeks before the wedding. But I was gone for a week of that. And we were both like at our respective parents' houses. So we didn't actually get any time. And we saw each other a handful of times in those six, seven months. So it's been definitely eye-opening, to say the least, and especially because when you're visiting with your significant other, when he would come to stay with me for four or five days at a time or, you know, whenever um, I would, we would go on trips or whatever, you're on your best behavior for a shortened amount of time. And you're just kind of like, oh, okay, it's okay. I'll deal with their quirks because it's only four or five days. And when you move in together, it's like, no, I really don't like that. And no, I actually really want, you know, the toilet seat down all the time. I really want this, you know, this, I need the dishes out of the sink the second that you're done with them. Like while you're eating, put them in the dishwasher. Like, you know, and like, it's been totally different. And that has been eye-opening and kind of funny at times, but also moments where we've looked at each other and been like, how did we get here? How did we actually cross you tying that mongol suit and actually us getting here, you know? Um, but no, I think overall it's been, it's been pretty good, but the one thing that uh, goes along with what Anjali was saying is that we actually do take a lot of space. So our apartment building has a lounge with conference rooms and workspaces. And so he actually does his work day down there. And for me, I stay in the apartment because I'm fine being cooped up for four weeks at a time and not actually ever leaving. So because of that, you know, it's worked out nicely because we do actually get space during the day. And then we end up coming back and being like, oh, this is great. Here, how was it? Di- let's have dinner. Let's cook together. And uh, we were talking about that today. Uh, I was like, you know, I was like, do you ever miss me during your day? And he's like, kind of just giving me this look like, I don't really know if I should say yes or no, you know, but we were kind of like, no, it's, it, we're actually at our each other's best if we have a little bit of time apart. And um, if we do get to come home and kind of like reunite at five o'clock, that feels a lot better than if we were together all day in a one bedroom apartment. So. Anjali, I want to know what some of those quirks, I don't, I don't even know if quirks is the right word. I mean, what some of those things might be that are important to you of the way that things get done. So I know Annika had just mentioned maybe dishes, toilet seat or something like that. What are your things? Um, I actually feel like it's kind of like the opposite for me and Sufi is that I'm trying to like accommodate her needs and her, as you say them, like quirks, um, as you call them quirks. Um, I just feel like for us, there aren't necessarily any like new issues that came out of this period of quarantine. It's just like all the little things kind of like what Annika was saying, all the little things are so amplified, like no matter how small they are. So like, I will always forget my hair in the shower drain. And like, I don't, I don't know if either of you have curly hair, like naturally curly I do. hair. You do? Yes. I do. And I, yeah, this is why it looks like this right now. Yeah. Yeah. And most of the time, actually, it's on top of my head. Yeah. Yeah. So when you, (laughs) when you do that, when you tie your hair up in a bun on your head, because it's curly and you have like three days to go to wash, but it doesn't look cute. You lose so much hair in the shower because it's just like chilling on top of your head. And that drives Soupy crazy because I never pick it up after I get out of the shower. (laughs) So like things like that. Um, I think one of my things is um, we have a really nice routine in my house, in my apartment, actually, where um, Sufi does the grocery shopping. I cook and then um, my roommate helps me kind of like sous chef and like chop things up. They do ginger and garlic like beautifully. Um, And then Sufi puts the food away in the fridge and then my roommate does the dishes like it's like a perfect system. We have leftovers for days. It's beautiful. But sometimes Sufi will wait a really long time before she puts the food away. And I'm just like sitting there and I'm so anxious. I'm like, put it away before it's going to go bad. It's going to go bad. If you don't put it away right now, it's going to go bad. Um, So I guess that's one of mine. (laughs) Um, 
But I feel like it's just like, it's amplified, right? Because we don't have all these other little distractions to pull us away from things. So the people that we're right next to all the time, they become our main focus. And those little things, they just mean so much more because they're such a big percentage of your day compared to before. 100%. Because usually we, you know, go to work or we go out or we're worried about our commute or we're thinking through like, oh, what do I have to have for, do for lunch? And usually we have like five to nine or like the hours, you know, that we're worried about our loved ones. But now, like Nehal was saying, like the boundary is gone. So it's much tougher now to sit there and say, you know, oh, yeah, I'll just worry about you at five o'clock because – you're together all the darn time, you know? And so it's it's definitely a lot more brutal, I think. But there's also really good things, too. You take on things that the other person has done. Like, even in the last whole week of marriage, it's been like, you know, oh, yeah, he likes it done this way. Let me take that on. And, like, now I find myself doing things a little bit differently and a little, probably a little bit better than I did previously. And I'm hoping that I have a positive influence on him. I haven't really checked yet, but... I'm hoping he's taken some of mine on. Have you taken any of Suvi's hobbies on and vice versa during shelter in place? Um, I feel like less hobbies and more work stuff, honestly. I think we're lucky that we get to do creative things that we like as a career and that they kind of, they cross in different places a little bit. So Suvi's a photographer and sometimes she shoots weddings and I am a wedding planner and I usually work with photographers. So We have yet to work on a wedding together where I'm the planner and she's the photographer, but I've definitely gotten really into helping Sufi at her shoots. I have the time to do that now because my work schedule is so flexible in quarantine. Again, there are no weddings happening right now, Um, (laughs) but I get to go and direct couples, which is so fun for me when she does her couple shoots because we're always doing that ourselves. Like we're always taking couple photos for Instagram. So I know all these poses and how to make couples feel comfortable in front of the camera and loosen up a little bit with each other. So I've been doing that a lot with her. Um, And Sufi's been, I don't know, Sufi's just been like supporting me with all the like design and visual stuff that I do with my job. I've kind of accidentally started doing social media for people in the wedding industry right now because everybody's like this is our downtime this is the time to get our website looking great our Instagram feeds looking great get our Pinterest game on Um, so I've been doing that for a couple of different vendors in the Bay Area and so Sufi's been helping me with that kind of stuff so it's nice because our hobbies are our work um, but then at the same time we're like always working (laughs) so you know, pros and cons, but we've definitely been helping each other out and taking those things on. I mean, yeah, you guys have been working a lot and then you're cooking and you're living together. But a lot of times people who are doing all this, they can get into a relationship rep, you know, because you're working all the time and you're not giving time to the relationship. So how do you guys keep things spicy and like date nights and stuff? How do you do all that? Where do you find the time for that? And what are some things that you've done during COVID that you can maybe tell our listeners about so they can get an idea to do with their partner? Yeah, um, I think since we're in such a routine right now, it doesn't take a whole lot to make things feel special. And that's not to say that we want to be like lazy about it. But I think something as small as like, hey, I went to the grocery store and I picked up these flowers for you can like make somebody's whole day, you know. Um, So I think we've been like tuning into one another's love languages a lot. Um, I know this isn't one of the official love languages, but Sufi's love language is definitely food. Um, (laughs) Is it all of ours? Because I'm guessing, yeah. (laughs) So um, I've been learning how to make a lot of like traditional food for her because she's not able to go back home to visit her family and chosen family in New York. So especially for Ramadan, I learned how to make a lot of things that she loves. Like I learned how to make um, chapli kebabs and samosas and biryani and all kinds of stuff. Um, So I think just like taking the extra time to like make food for her and then light some candles and then put on a movie that we've been meaning to watch for a while and just like enjoy our night together. That makes a huge difference for us. And we're able to do that once every week or every two weeks, just like spice things up, do one night. That's like a little bit different, go for a picnic, just the two of us, because that's one of the things to do that's safe right now. Um, those kinds of things really make us feel special and like cared for in a time when we're just 
working and doing things that are a little bit stressful all the time together. So Anjali, you talk a lot about mental health on your social media accounts. You've been very open about a lot of it that people have not talked about in this South Asian community. You know, I think recently we even became began talking about it on our podcast. And so it's very new for us to even open up about it. So can you just tell us a little bit about your relationship with mental health and how that's been and why you're so passionate about it? Yeah, um, I was diagnosed with depression when I was 16 and anxiety when I was 17. So my senior year of high school was not a great year for me. Um, And I've struggled with depression and anxiety for a long time. I think it's one of those things where you don't necessarily wake up one day and say, I'm cured. But over time, the I like to I like to describe it as depression coming and going in waves, and you just become more and more skilled at riding them out and they sometimes are shorter and smaller and come less frequently and sometimes you get a huge wave all at once and you feel like you might drown so um i feel like in quarantine it's been hard because let me backtrack a little bit i was really fortunate to have access to therapy back when i was first diagnosed and so over those couple years that i did have access to therapy i was able to develop these systems that really helped me. And that's what, like a lot of what um, therapy is when you're really young and you're, you feel like it's an emergency all the time is just building out like an emergency plan and the things that help you, the things that make you feel calm when you're anxious, the people that you can go to. And a lot of those things aren't accessible right now in quarantine. Like a lot of the things that I normally do or the people that I normally go to or the, you know, one of my things was I used to go over to my friend's place and we used to color together because it made us feel calm. Like, I can't do that right now because we're in quarantine. So I think um, building up a new routine right now has been really important. And I know that a lot of people have been struggling a lot with that. And it's something that I fortunately have a lot of experience with. So I feel like it's important to talk about that and let people know that, you know, I have this huge platform and I post all these pictures of me smiling all the time with my partner, but like life is not perfect all the time. Mental health is hard. It can be really, really hard right now, especially because people don't have access to the things that they normally do and that it's okay to not be okay and need time to figure out what those things are. I love your analogy about the waves because I also struggle with depression and I was diagnosed around the same time, actually at the same age. Um, but with anxiety in, in my late twenties. And so quarantine has been, at first I was like, this is great. Like, this is awesome. I don't have to go anywhere. I don't have to wear pants. This is the best life ever. And, uh, at first I was like, okay, this is cool. And then, you know, partway through the summer, it was like hitting a brick wall. And I was just like, I, I don't know anymore how to do this. And and Nahal knows this because we were both going through major life transitions at the same time on a lot of different fronts. It wasn't just like, like Nail started a new job and I uh, was thinking about it pivoting. I'm starting to think about pivoting mine. And, and, you know, there was a lot of different things happening with the podcast and happening with our our personal lives. And, you know, it, it was like we were running and we were happy and it was great. And then suddenly it was like, oh, no, no, no. The wave hit me in the face and it was like totally derailed. And, um, you know, I think that that, that analogy is so good because sometimes it's something you're just like, okay, I can overcome this. It's, it's fine. It's just a little bump in the road. And other times it's like, all right, that was a straight up roller coaster and I got thrown off halfway through it. So, you know, it's it's definitely powerful to think about that and also really important to, to remind yourself that there are tiny moments that you'll, you'll get past and then the bigger ones, you're going to have to really set some coping mechanisms into place and figure out how to kind of scaffold yourself so that you'll stay you know, all together as much as you can and really build out that support system for yourself as well. How do you like check in with yourself? I know a lot of times when you're on a high, you're on a really amazing high. So, you know, you're really happy, really excited. Everything's going the way that you want it to go. But then the lows are so low that, you know, you don't want to get out of bed and you're just, you just don't know how to feel anymore. So how do you make sure to, you know, check in with yourself and give yourself a reality check once in a while just to be like, okay, am I really okay? Or is this something that's just... A temporary or give us some tips on that 
I think I've gotten pretty good at identifying when I'm not feeling good and identifying when things are kind of on a downhill track for me. I think right now, because I'm not necessarily working at a corporate job where I have to be up at a certain time every day and report to people at a certain time every day, it's been really important for me to check in with myself more often because with a freelance schedule, it's so easy to just like disappear for a week and, you know, still meet all your deadlines by working until midnight on the day before it's due or something like that. So I feel like it definitely takes a lot of practice, but I think there are different signs that you could pick up on. For me personally, it's if I'm having a hard time getting out of bed before 10 a.m. or if I'm like really struggling to get out of bed when I do have to be up early, I know that maybe I'm staying up too late, which is something that, you know, happens when I'm getting into a funk or like a lot of like physical things like how much I'm eating, how often I'm eating, if I'm eating healthy stuff or if I'm going for something that's quick and easy because I don't feel like I have the energy to cook. Those kinds of things are like outside signs that something is going downhill internally with me. Um, And it's not like, it's not perfect. It's not a perfect system. Sometimes, you know, exercise is a really big one for me that helps me manage my moods and manage like how I feel every day. And sometimes I'll be exercising every day and I'll still be in a funk. Um, So it's not a perfect system, but just checking in with myself and seeing where all of those physical things are at that I use to measure, like if I'm doing well, if I'm taking care of myself, that is a really good way for me to check in. And it definitely took practice to get here. And how do you, would you like your partner to respond? A lot of times when people are feeling, you know, like that, they're usually like, get away from me. I don't want to be you know, with anyone, but then some people are the opposite. They're like, no, I want to be coddled in love, like hug me, kiss me and everything. And so what are you like? Um, honestly, I am so blessed to have Sufi. Um, she is like, as far as, you know, no Nazar and all that, but like, as far as partners go, she is so good to me when I'm in a funk and I'm so blessed to have her. I'm going to try not to cry while I say this, <laughs> but, um, I think For me, a lot of things that feel normal to other people, like folding laundry or putting away my dishes or even walking in the front door and putting my coat away, just feel monumentally hard for me when I'm in a funk. They're they're just so difficult. So that's where Sufi steps in and is like, you know what? It's okay that you feel this way. I'm just going to take over from here. And she just like, She does those things that like feel so hard for me. And I think those are, those are the ways that she really shows up for me. And I think that's part of the reason why I'm so strongly like acts of service is my love language, because that makes me feel so loved and cared for when I just know that there are things that are so hard for me to do, but she's right there to catch me and right there to keep me on track so that I can just focus on doing the things that are my coping mechanisms. That is such a great point about how these tiny things feel so heavy. There's an intensity on the smaller things that typically people would say are the tiny little things no one even thinks twice about. And it's really hard to go through your everyday movements feeling that kind of weight. So it is really magical when you have someone who's willing to take a little bit of off your shoulders and be willing to share that burden. But on top of that, it's also a really good reminder for all of us to do the same thing for other people who might be struggling a little bit, especially now. And this is, of course, now we're seven months into this quarantine period and perhaps everybody's figured it out, but perhaps we're struggling too still to find some semblance of normal. But it's a really good reminder for our listeners that that extra bit of kindness or that little bit of effort could be taking that burden off the shoulders of someone who really needs a little bit of help to get through their day. Before we wrap up today, Anjali, I do want to ask if you have any final thoughts for our listeners on just anything that we've talked about today, uh, whether you want to talk about, you know, finding those boundaries, giving yourself that mental health space that you need during COVID and just living with your partner. So if you have anything to say, this is the time. Yeah, totally. Um, I think that the common thing that I see in all of these questions, or I guess in all of my responses to them is that you have to, or I guess I had to at one point in my life, really learn how to say the way that I feel matters, and it deserves attention. And I think that 
the way that I was raised was like to put, always put guests first and make sure that other people around me feel comfortable. Um, and that has its merits. And I'm so happy to have been raised that way and to be able to make other people feel so comfortable and loved in my home and in my presence, hopefully all the time. <laughs> um, um, but, you know, it, there was definitely a turning point where I had to be like, oh, it really matters whether or not I feel good today. It really matters whether or not I have the space that I need. It really matters whether or not, whether, whether or not I'm meeting my own needs. Um, and I think prioritizing yourself, even within the relation, within a relationship or within your own mental health journey can be really, really hard, but it's so important. So if there's anything that I want listeners to walk away from this episode, knowing is that you're important, the way that you feel matters, and you need to be able to feel comfortable saying, hey, I don't feel right about this right now. And I want to make sure that I feel better, whether that's setting a boundary with somebody else saying, hey, stop doing this thing that's really hurting me and really making me feel not so great. Or whether it's with yourself and saying, hey, I need to take the time to find accessible therapy or free therapy or a group or somebody to talk to, whatever that looks like for each individual person, because I'm not feeling good right now. And I need to, I need to take care of myself. So before we head out, Anjali, we actually have the quick thing that we do with all of our guests, which is Nehal's favorite time of the episode, and it's a rapid fire. So I'm going to quickly ask you just a couple of questions. You answer in one word or a few words, and we keep it fast and speedy. Are you ready? Oh my God, I'm so nervous. Okay, hit me with it. <laughs> okay, favorite mental health care tip? Ooh, um, oh my gosh, drink water. <laughs> TV show you're currently binge watching? What am I watching right now? Oh my God, Selling Sunset. I'm obsessed. <laughs> <laughs> it's so bad, but it's so good. No, so but I love it. I'm on season I one. Won't. Favorite brand that you've worked with? Oh, that I've worked with. I honestly love all of them. I'm just like so, I'm still like, this is all so new to me. I'm so shocked that people want to work with me. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Fun project that you're working on or could give, give us an exclusive on maybe? Yes. Oh my gosh. Um, Sufi and I are working on a web series called How We Adult, which is specifically geared towards LGBTQ people who were kicked out of their homes or had to run away from home when they were young, much like Sufi did. Um, so we have try to keep this rapid. Um, we have learned a lot about one another and like the th different things that we had access to um, because of our different circumstances growing up. So that's kind of our way of gr bridging the privilege gap and the gap between our, our experiences. So, Oh my God, I love that. When is that coming out? When can we look forward to it? Give us a, actually more details. F the rapid fire. <laughs> um, oh my gosh, I actually don't know when it's going to come out. Our goal is to release the first couple videos before the end of the year, but that might change. Um, that has been our goal, but um, with COVID and with all the other ways that we've been trying to like support ourselves and keep things going since our normal work lives have kind of been disrupted, um, we're not sure if that's going to be the actual goal date but we're that sounds magical <laughs> oh my god that I can't wait. amazing you have to let us know when like the trailer or something comes out for that so we can post it on our woke Daisy account because we'd love to promote it that would be super cool of you guys yeah yes. we're, we're gonna do an intro video for sure so i'll send it to you awesome and then lastly what is a small business you want to give a shout out to right now oh my gosh there are so i knew many. you were gonna say that <laughs> I like I have a whole highlight on my Instagram profile about QTPOC owned small businesses. Um, so I guess the most recent one is this body butter company called by Tony Naturals. Um, it's a black owned business. Um, it's woman owned. She makes all the products in her kitchen. Um, she's super cool. She's so sweet. And she actually made the body butters because she has eczema. And she like, wants wanted something that was actually effective for her skin and it's so good her products are so good i recommend them to everyone i just gave my sister a bunch of mine because i really want her to try it out um but it's just like my current obsession that's awesome that is an amazing amazing uh, sort of company to start and also one to support but Anjali, we just wanted to thank you for being on this episode with us and taking the time to be able to talk to us about things that, as you mentioned, are highly personal, but also 
a reflection of everybody out there and especially the LGBTQI population out there. And we're just so happy to have you and we really appreciate all the time that you've given us. For our listeners, follow Anjali on social media at Anjali Chakra and also follow The Woke Desi on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram. Like we always say, get woke, stay woke. This is The Woke Desi.